Right. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I have a little assistant with us today until Dad gets here for a few minutes. But we are going live on Facebook. Can you say hi, Tristan? Can you wave? Hi. Hi. Tristan's going to tell you all of his recruiting pet peeves today. Yes. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, my name is J.B. Chapman. I'm the founder and CEO of Begin Within. And we have a very special guest on today. His name is Josh Deason. He's a Coca-Cola recruiter, and he's going to answer all of the questions that you have that you've always wanted to ask a recruiter when they didn't answer your emails. And Josh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Josh Deason. I'm currently a recruiter, uh, the corporate recruiter for Coca-Cola, and um, I'm headquartered out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am an Army veteran. I served 14 years in the Army, and a lot of that was in the Army Recruiting Command. So I have a lot of experience in, in applying for positions, interviewing for positions, being selected for positions, um, and ultimately how to interact with recruiters as well. So I'm definitely glad to be here and glad to join Jamie on this. And thank you for your time today. Um, we are going to start out by just sort of talking about What's it like a day in the a day in the life of a recruiter? What does your day look like? And maybe as a job applicant, how can we knock your socks off whenever we want to try to impress you and get a job? So, um, you know, a, a day in the life of the recruiter, a lot of times we are working through our candidates actively. Um, there's not really a rhyme or reason a lot of times because we do have a lot of positions that we're trying to fill. So, um, you know, a lot of times we come in in the mornings and, and we're handling the, the first to fire issues. So anyone that has a start date coming up and things like that, uh, we're usually trying to take care of our candidates and get them ready to get their foot in the door uh, to make sure that they can start employment. But um, on, on the recruiting and job application side of everything, um, you know, we're, we're typically going to start looking at the candidates that have been sitting in a status for a long time. And so a lot of times if you haven't heard anything for just one or two days after you've applied, it's OK because sometimes we're reaching out to those that applied maybe a week ago that we haven't had a chance to get to yet. Um, and, and so a lot of times we're going to work through that and start working through kind of an order of events on that. So, um, but that's typically what I do. You know, every, every day is, is different issues between people trying to get set up to um, fill out W-9 paperwork for, for new hire orientation and find their birth certificate. Uh, you know, just these little things that you don't really think about that, that recruiters get involved with that we do. Um, so it's, it's definitely it's definitely a fun job. It's a fun position. So we do enjoy doing it. Those of us that do it as a career. And um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a fun time. So um, knocking our socks off is uh, first and foremost is being responsive to your recruiter. Right. Um, so, you know, if we say, hey, I need you to go online and update your application because maybe your driver's license was a digit off or something like that. Um, you know, the sooner the better, because now we're waiting on you. The ball is in your court. And so. Uh, you know, a, a, a very responsive and attentive candidate um, is definitely a way that impresses us because we also relay that to the hiring managers when they say, hey, how was this candidate during the during the interview process, the initial time? We're going to bring that stuff up like, hey, every time I asked Jamie to do something, she was on top of it because that's also going to be a reflection of you as an employee um, for our company as you know what you do in your application stage. OK, that that brings a question on for me. So. What is the threshold? Where's that line in the sand when we're talking about being responsive and being proactive versus being annoying? How, how do you determine that? So, uh, and, and that's a great question because, and, and I've probably had that question from other candidates before. They were like, I don't know if I need to step out of work right away. Um, you know, usually if we send you an email about something, for example, then it's not a very hot, sensitive topic because we're, we're, we're willing to wait for you to read your email and respond to your email. Um, so if you get an email from a recruiter about something, that's usually just like a, hey, as soon as you can get to this, get to it and get it to me. Uh, but, you know, if we call and we leave a voicemail or we text you again, don't run out of your current job. If, if you haven't already received our job uh, to answer a recruiter's call, because you don't want to jeopardize your current role for a role that you don't have yet. Um, but if you do see a call from us or a text message from us, then that's definitely at your earliest convenience. And it's probably a little bit more urgent than, than if we were to email you about something. Uh, and so usually, you know, if, if we usually give everyone at least 24 hours before we start looking at somebody kind of sideways, um, because we at least say, hey, some people don't have access to email for the entire work day. Um, some people have to go pick up kids after after work and they don't have time to respond to us till the evening. So we understand. Don't don't feel like you're in a panic, like, oh, I need to respond right away or else, you know, it's going to look really bad on me. 
Um, there, there is a, a time there to, to do that. And then um, if you're talking about, you know, following up with your recruiter and staying engaged from the candidate side to the recruiter, you know, when it becomes annoying, it, it, I, don't, I don't know if it ever really becomes annoying. Um, you know, sometimes we just don't have an answer. So we'll get candidates that are like, hey, what's that bit on my, on my application? Well, it might not be in, in the recruiter's court. Uh, the ball could be in the hiring manager's court. So if you ask me every day or a couple of times a day if I have an update, I might only get my updates once a week. And uh, so it does help from the recruiter side, though, if you communicate that. And if I say, hey, I really don't get updates until Fridays, then maybe the candidate understands that. Now, if I tell the candidate on Monday, I don't get updates until Friday, and the candidate reaches out to me Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for an update, now you're a candidate that doesn't listen or doesn't follow instructions, you know? And so <laughs> it's just really like paying attention, you know? So it's, so it's not really that it annoys us. It only annoys us like if it, it, it gives us red flags that if we tell you one thing and then you tend to go the other direction, it just kind of gives us a sign that, hey, maybe this person doesn't pick up on this, like, you know, the day of the week thing or, you know, just kind of like some basic instructions on when to follow up. Right. And those are good points. And if you hear background noise, I apologize. Um, <laughs> but that brought me to another question. You were talking about uh, receiving updates and those updates you're talking about. Are you talking about hiring managers to recruiters or how, what are you talking about exactly? Yeah, most of the time it is. And, and a lot of times candidates think that the recruiter is, you know, the know all and that we have all the power and then if they got a job or not, it, it reflects on the recruiter. And usually we're not the hiring authority for positions, especially not in a corporate environment. All I do is I facilitate the interview process for the candidate up to the hiring manager. And then it's the hiring manager's decision. Now, they might take recommendations from the recruiter based on our discussions that we've had with the candidates. But, you know, once I pass a candidate to a stage and say, hey, will you review this candidate's resume and the notes from our phone calls? and uh, let me know what you think. Then it's up to that hiring manager to tell me, yes, I would like to interview this person. No, I would not like to interview this person. And so, you know, when, when you're in a corporation like ours where it's worldwide and, but you know, our, our main area is gonna be in the, the continental United States, we have a lot of hiring managers that do a lot of traveling. So some hiring managers say, hey, I'm not gonna be back in Atlanta until, you know, the middle of next month and I'd like to do interviews then. And so we really don't have interviews set up sometimes for, you know, a little bit out in advance. So, um, so yes, it's just updates for that. Sometimes we just don't know. We will put people in their, in their queue and, and we'll ask, Hey, can you review these? And then as they get to those, they'll update us. But until they do, we really don't have, we don't have any feedback or any updates for the candidate. Slight meltdown. No, no problem though. Right. They happen. But yeah, for for um, for the most part, when when we're looking at updates and stuff, a lot of times when we get a position and we're trying to fill that position within 30 days. So a lot of times if, if you've seen a position that's sitting out there for longer than 30 or if you apply it after it just posted and it's been past 30 days, um, then, you know, the chances are that they might already be interviewing candidates and you're you've kind of fallen back on that second or third tier where, hey, after the first round of interviews happens, maybe you get to move into that spot. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can delay the communication from the recruiter side on that. I'm afraid if I take it off mute, he's going to scream any louder. But um, I was hoping you could talk about applicant tracking systems for a little bit and tell oh, us sure. matrix wise what works. Yeah, absolutely. So for the applicant tracking systems, you are going to see things where a lot of companies have the tracking systems that will filter your application out um, just based on what's in your resume or even in your cover letters. So um, a lot of times on that, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that your resume mirrors what's on the job description. And a lot of times you can't assume that the recruiter knows everything about your career field or your position. And so if let's say that we look for someone with experience with an ATS, let's say we're hiring a recruiter and ATS is an applicant tracking system. So a lot of times what we'll do for our job descriptions is we'll say that we were looking for experience with ATS. Well, if your resume only says, I have experience with an applicant tracking system and it doesn't match that our job description says ATS, it's not gonna pick up that you meet that requirement. It's not gonna pick that up. And as a recruiter, I might not know what that is, um, especially when we start getting into you know the IT fields and stuff and you start talking about 
C++ certifications and stuff. We don't, we might not know what that is. And so it's important that if you see it on the job description, that you actually have it verbatim for what's in the job description on your resume, if you have that experience. And that way your, your application doesn't get automatically filtered out. Uh, and then we're also able to put in automatic disqualifiers on our end as well. So we can say things like it requires three years of experience in this certain role. And if you click, no, I don't have three years experience, you're automatically going to get pushed down and a recruiter will never see your application. So make sure you read those questions as well. And so the gist of the story here is basically make sure you're a hundred percent qualified for that job before you bother applying yes. or you're just wasting your time. Right? Yes, because if, if you're applying for something, you're thinking, well, maybe they'll give me a chance, but I don't have this experience. A lot of times the recruiter is not even going to see that because the system is going to filter that out for us. And so, you know, if, if we know there are those things where they'll say, you know, it requires a bachelor's degree or three to five years, perfectly safe. That's not going to filter anybody out. And we usually don't even put those in as automatic disqualifiers because it does kind of leave it open to interpretation uh, of what the, the experience could be. But yeah, absolutely. We, we do see applications that kind of that they get through the system sometimes and, uh, you know, we look at it and, and they don't have any experience whatsoever that we need. OK. And a question of, for clarification for me, um, when you're writing, a, say, a resume bullet and we're using a verb. Right. And perhaps that action is it's actually in the job announcement. If we change the tense of the, the word from past tense to present tense or whatever, does your applicant tracking system recognize the word anyway, or does it does it not read it because the tense is different? Does that make sense? Right. A lot of times, what will happen is when they when they build these uh, when they build these systems in there to filter those out, they'll usually put different variations of each word like that for words that can be taken different ways, okay. um, or they'll just put like the root word and then it'll attach the other ones to that. Okay. Um, systems like our like ours specifically for for uh, for Coca-Cola, we don't use those filtering technologies. So we strictly only filter out based on the qualifications for the position that we're looking for. Okay. Um, and that would be the questions that the candidate can answer themselves on their online application. Okay. And you, I'm assuming as a recruiter who's seen thousands of these resumes, you can tell, right? When somebody just cuts and pastes the job announcement into their resume versus utilizing it for a little bit of inspiration right? Yes, absolutely. And and we can also tell if it's just the same resume that you've sent everybody else, because there's nothing in there that's tailored to the position you're applying for. Uh, primarily at the very top, when someone puts their objective or whatever you want to call it, everyone calls it something different, their headline or whatever, uh, at the top of the resume, that's also very important because we'll have people that will apply for positions, let's say for customer service, um, and, and their resume at the top says looking for a career uh, as to use my marketing degree as a marketing professional, but you apply for a customer service position. So your resume says you're looking for a position in marketing, but you're applying for, and I understand what they're doing. You just want to get your foot in the door with a good company, even at customer service and then work your way into marketing. But you still have to tell us why you want that position that you're applying for. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the five, 10 year plan can be talking, you know, that, that can be discussed during your interview, but your first step is, I need to get an interview for this job that I'm applying for. And it's very important to make sure your resume and cover letter states that. And don't be generic. If you say generic, it's an automatic eye roll. <laughs> you know that you're being generic because it says looking for a, a position with a great company. And it's just nothing specific about the role or the company itself. Automatic eye roll. That's the word of the day. Oh, right? it's <laughs> not disqualified. We're still going to look at the application, but we're not going to be as impressed as if it was actually tailored to our company in the position. Yeah. If, uh, you brought up cover letters. And so applicants ask me all the time, Hey, Jamie, is it even worth bothering attaching a cover letter? Does it add any value? People don't read them, right? You tell me what you think about cover letters. Uh, so this is a per just personal. Um, so it's definitely not across the board because like you said, everybody's different. Some people think it looks one way if you have one on one, if you don't. Um, I typically don't usually read cover letters unless there's a question that I have on the resume. And that's what I usually tell people is to use a cover letter to answer the questions that you don't put on your resume because you're trying to make that resume one or two page. Mm -hmm. So things like if, if you currently live out of state, but you're already relocating to a new state, 
And so your address on your resume is where you currently live. Maybe your cover letter addresses that at the very beginning. Hey, I'm relocating. I'm already planning to move, you know, those kind of things. Um, I don't really read cover letters to just just because a lot of them are going to say the same thing. And, and a lot of them I can pick up from a, from a resume. I mean, I understand that you've been in this career field for so many years. I can see that on your resume. Right. Um, but yeah, I've, I have talked with other recruiters that say, oh, yeah, you have to have a cover letter or you have to. Um, I mean, I'm, as a side to that, though, I would say that if you're applying for an executive level position where you're applying to be a director or a vice president somewhere, I would absolutely have a cover letter just as a, as it will look more professional. Um, but as like an everyday job seeker candidate coming through the line, I mean, I, I don't even think I usually click to see if they attached one to their to their application, to be honest with you. And when you forward it after you take a look and you determine that they're qualified, do the hiring managers look at them in your experience? In mine, they usually just look at the resume. Um, they, they usually just want to know, um, you know, what, what experience they have that matches the, you know, the candidate that they're looking for. So uh, most of the times they've never asked me for a cover letter. Um, but if sometimes they, if, if it's like a relocation or something like that, or someone had a huge job gap and they identify that in the cover letter or something like that, then, um, you know, I would relay that off of what I read off the cover letter. But from the hiring manager standpoint, um, most of the time they're just looking for that experience. OK, great. That's good to know. Um, I think with some applications and I'm not sure how this is with Coca-Cola, it requires you to attach the cover letter. But then people just attach a garbage cover letter that we know never gets read. So right, <laughs> right. it's about that from a recruiter's perspective, which I love. I, I actually had some, um, we did a, a career on the move guide and we discussed cover letters addressing exactly what you're talking about with military right. spouses, especially relocating a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good place to address it. So uh, that was a great, um, that was a great, kind of summary of what the heck cover letters do and what they're for. Right. I want to shift gears a little bit um, and kind of focus on your interview process, if that makes sense. So at Coca-Cola, um, it could be different in other places as well. But do you you screen the candidates and do you do telephone screenings just to make sure they're qualified and then forward them on to the hiring manager for their interview? Or do you conduct the initial interview? How does that work? So a lot of times we're going to do an initial phone screen for every candidate. And, and that's regardless of if, if I'm going to conduct a face-to-face -face interview or not, there's usually going to be a phone screen that takes place first. And that is just to confirm interest is to confirm that what's on the resume is true and accurate. And also in their application, because candidates do make errors in applications and we understand that. So sometimes we want to reach out and just, especially if it just looks really off based on their experience, what we've seen, you know, we, we will reach out. Um, also when you start talking about, I like to pay and people, you know, companies don't want to post the salary ranges on, online, you know, for various reasons. And then the candidate doesn't put their minimum salary requirements on their application either. So now you're just kind of like, well, do we waste time interviewing this person or not? And then we don't know. So a lot of times that's what the phone screen is for, just to call and say, hey, do you have, you know, is there a pay range or, um, you know, sometimes we have positions that just have one pay rate, like our hourly positions. And so sometimes we'll call and say, hey, this position starts at this rate. Is this okay with you? And so, um, and, and it's not negotiable. I, I now just tell them up front, let's, I, I don't want to waste anyone's time. So I'll let them know it does. It's not, well, maybe you'll get this if you have more experience. It's going to be, <laughs> this job starts here. And so it, it's kind of like to fill that out and make sure that we want to spend that time because an interview is usually going to be at least an hour of somebody's day to include ours. And so it's really just to make sure that before we set the interview, that that works. And, at the same time, phone screens can be used as kind of like the step one of the interview. So if I'm interviewing for someone for a customer service position that's going to be on the phone with our customers and that are supposed to be very nice and respectful and bubbly on the telephone, and then I'm on the phone with you and you sound like you have zero personality and zero telephone skills, I'm probably not going to call you in for an interview for customer service. <laughs> Uh, and so it, it's it's picking up on those things, though, and, and we usually ask standard interview questions. So we actually ask the same interview questions to every single candidate who we get on the telephone with. Every single question is identical. And so I, it kind of picks up on that. So if I ask you a question about something and you're very hesitant to answer or you can't answer, or it sounds like you're dodging a question about why you left your, pre uh, left your previous employer. 
uh, you know, we're, we're really looking for anything that could be a red flag, but also looking for you to be a fit for the position in our company as well. That's great. That's great information. I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to ask you to describe or, you know, give us your best advice. And then after this, we'll go into your pet peeves. Uh, so best advice for the interview process is, you know, first off, when you're if you're coming in for an in-person interview, make sure that you're prepared for the interview. And that means everything down to the dress code. If, if you don't know what the dress code is or you're not sure what they're right and left limits are on business casual or something like that, then you ask the recruiter, that's what we're here for. And we don't mind. Um, I've, I've had female candidates because females always have the issue with, is it a sandal or is it a flip flop? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's like our biggest hang up <laughs> is the shoes that, that the females can wear for business casual because we tell them we don't allow flip flops, but then there's it's summertime in Alabama. And so a lot of, you know, women are like, well, we, you know, I wear this style and I'm like, look, and for general rule, just so you know, as long as it has a strap that goes around the back of the heel, then it's technically it's supposed to be called a sandal. Okay. But I've had female candidates send me pictures like these are the shoes that I'm thinking about wearing. And I don't mind one bit. And I even relayed to the hiring manager and said, this is how invested she is in this interview. So she was already getting like thumbs up. Oh but, man! Of course, I don't know. So I'm showing the other females in the office, like, what is this shoe? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, she asked me about a flat. What is a flat? <laughs> you know, I don't know these. Oh. So, uh, so yeah, it's you know being prepared for that on that, and also knowing the position you're applying for. You know, you don't want to walk in an interview and say, "Well, tell me about the job," um, or about what your company does. You should already have those notes. So. Uh, you know, really be prepared for the interview, you know, itself and just make sure you're prepared for that and uh, and, and it should be fine. Okay. Um, my assistant's here. He's two years old and he's demanding a snack. So I'll uh, ask you a question and maybe hop off for just two seconds. Um, this one is your pet peeves. Yeah, um, that's actually very good. So. Uh, the pet peeves that we usually get is, um, you know, first off, people that, that don't communicate. If, you know, if you're going to be late for an interview because you got caught up in traffic or something like that, just let the recruiter know. Don't be afraid and don't say, oh, well, I think I can make it. And then you wait to the last minute. The earlier you can tell us that you're going to be late for an interview, the better, because then we can we can adjust if we need to. Or maybe we don't stop what we're doing at work to go into a meeting room for our interview with you and then find out you're going to be a little bit late. We could have kept working at our desk on something before we left. So just communicate with us if you're going to be late. And it's OK if you are. Life happens and we understand that, yeah, um, that's a good point. you know. Yeah. And, and then some of the other pet peeves that we get are a lot of them are with like the dress code and things like that. So we'll get candidates that show up in tennis shoes. We never allow tennis shoes at work any day of the year. And and so, you know, if, if they would have just asked about that, then they would have known, um, you know, we don't allow facial piercings and things like that at work. So just like be aware of that, um, you know, and, and and just make sure that you're you're dressed according to the position. You don't have to wear a suit and tie. We don't wear suits and ties at work. So you don't have to go that far um, for, you know, for the everyday positions that we usually hire for. But, um, you know, I would say, to I, you know, really be pay attention to that. Um, from the interview process, you know, we do get candidates that um, that come in sometimes and and it seemed like they were interested in the position when they applied and then when they got here, they're not. Um, we've also had it where the person who showed up for the interview is not the person that we spoke to on the phone. You know, they're the same individual. Right. But not the same person whatsoever. Um, happened just yesterday, as a matter of fact. I'm like, that is, she was totally different on the phone. I Interesting. Promise. I'm like, I <laughs> she was different. She sounded terrific on the telephone. Um, so, you know, be who you are on the phone call that you're going to be in the in-person interview as well, because we're not going to get you in the door and then, you know, <laughs> change our mind about what we're looking for. So, okay. um, and then I would also say in a company like ours, when you're talking about production, don't bring a competitor's brand into your interview. <laughs> so if you're interviewing for a job with Coca-Cola, don't walk in with a Mountain Dew. Um, you know, and, and try to know, try to know the, the extent of it. So like we're a bottling company for Coca-Cola suite, so you know, Coca-Cola company bottles, Dasani waters and things like that. So it's things that you might not know about, but you should, you can ask. So if you usually drink Aquafina water and you say, Hey, Josh, I'm going to bring a 
Aquafina bottle. Is that okay? I'm going to say, heck no, you better throw it in the trash before you walk in the building. <laughs> um, we will give you a Dasani or a smart water when you arrive. Uh -huh. So just pay attention to that. If, if the company is one of those that would be competing with other industries like that, then just make sure you don't bring a competitor's brand. Yeah. That's a really good point that a lot of people probably do not think at all about. Um, and I remember talking with you about that before and I had no idea who made Aquafina or Dasani water. I didn't right. even think about it. But right. if I'd walked in with the wrong bottle of water to this job interview, it would have, I wouldn't have got the job because you guys, I, you should research the company before you go in for a job interview. Right. And I mean, and we've hired people that didn't know and that brought in a, a competitor's brand. You know, it's not something that we would just say, Oh, you're not getting this job whatsoever. Um, but it just, it does like, you know, it would really come down to that thing where let's say you've got a couple of candidates and they're just neck and neck on it. We're going to look back on what the other ones did extra that, that some did not. So if we know that, you know, someone brought a competitor's branding. We know that person didn't do their research. So now, you know, maybe the other two were more prepared for the interview than the other person was. Right. And so that's such a good point. Uh, a lot of people would never think about it, especially because in the circles I run in is the military community. It's government. We don't think about the competitive landscape of corporate America and production, right. how it's Coke versus Pepsi. We don't think about that. It's just we do our jobs and we go home every day. Yeah. Um, do you have any more pet peeves before we move along? Um, you know, I, I'll just say that most of it is is all in the preparation when it when it goes into that. And um, you know, we uh, I'll I will give another tip though that's it, it kind of sits in between the really good advice and then also the pet peeve is that uh, you make sure that you answer the question in an interview. Okay. So a lot of times these questions are very specific. So, and I'll give you an example of one. Let's say that we ask you, Hey, give me an example of a time when this happened and how you handled the situation. So if you come at it and say, well, usually in those situations, I do this, that, and the other, you didn't answer the question because what I said was give me an example. So that means that your answer should have been when I worked at this location, you know, for this company on this, you know, this time, this customer came in and this happened or whatever the situation was, you know, we're looking for an example. We want you to tell us about a real example, not a general idea of how you handle certain situations. So listen on the question, make sure you understand it. If you need us to repeat the question, that's fine. We don't mind one bit. We don't think you're not listening. We are thinking that you are just trying to clarify what we're asking and it's fine to do that. Um, but just make sure that you answer the question. Cause a lot of times we'll ask questions about things like, you know, how do you handle, you know, uh, angry customers? And they'll go, well, usually, you know, we handle them in a certain way, but when we ask it, we should say, give us an example of how you handled that. Um, and we usually get, sometimes we'll get a general answer and we usually don't even write the answer down. The note we write is did not answer question. And that, and it's, you know, and it's, it's huge. Um, you know, so, so give detailed examples when they're asked about that. Um, and then, you know, that way we, we know that you understood the question that we can kind of, gauge our next questions off of that as well. Can you tell if somebody memorizes their answers or over prepares and it's sort of scripted? Yeah, a lot of times you can just because it's it's going to be just a really generic answer. And so a lot of times um, what happens is, um, you know, we, we might ask certain questions in, in a different way. We might just reword it a little bit and ask something a little bit different. And so sometimes you'll see people stumbling and Maybe they look shocked that you asked a question. So you're thinking, well, what did you talk to someone that you think you knew what all the questions were? Because um, we'll have a panel of a lot of questions we can ask and we select certain questions and then we ask each candidate the same questions. So they're not going to always be the same every time we run through a new job requisition either. And so, um, you know, that that is one thing that we look for in that. That's great. Um, I always, interviewing is something that everybody you know, if just the same way as a resume, if you ask a hundred people for their resume writing tips, you're going to get a hundred different answers. Right. And with interviewing, it's the same way. If you ask a hundred people, how do I ace this interview? You're going to learn a hundred different ways to ace an interview and they may or may not be right, or they may or may not give you good advice. Right. And it's probably very different with every single company. I know that, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
And we did our best to stay to the little script and have people answer the questions, but it's just totally different versus, you know, when I have 10 people that applied to the job and you had hundreds, it's a different right. animal to handle entirely. Right. Um, how many uh, of all the jobs that you've ever hired for, can you remember off the top of your head, the one that had the most applicants and how many there were? So a lot of times for us, the, uh, the, the customer service positions usually get pretty flooded. They are entry level positions of the company. They don't require a college degree. And so a lot of times we'll get flooded with those. And so uh, a lot of times the, by the time the requisition stayed open for seven to 10 days, I mean, I could have 50 or 60 applications already just in that, wow. in that time frame. And sometimes more than that, sometimes we try not to even let it stay open that long whenever we open up a new position, just because we do need to get through all, all of the candidates who did apply. And so, um, but yeah, a lot of those positions can get really flooded. If you see positions that don't have a lot of uh, required qualifications on the bottom, then, I mean, you will get everybody, everybody who's looking for a position will, will be applying for it. So the numbers can climb pretty fast. <laughs> That's good to know. And it's super fast. It must be very competitive. Yes. When you're looking at these applications, um, um, applicant, let's just pretend we have 60 people that apply or 100. Mm -hmm. Let's make it 100 because that's easier to do the math. Um, how many people in your applicant tracking system, you said that if they just check, no, I don't have three years of experience. Out of those 100 people, how many on average disqualify themselves and shouldn't have bothered applying versus how many actually trickle through and get an interview? It's actually a really low number that that we that we see most of the time because I think a lot of uh, I think a lot of candidates do read the job description and I think a lot of people do not apply because of that. Uh, at the same time, we don't use those filters a whole lot, um, you know, to, to automatically DQ people just from our from our side because a lot of times we do want to make sure that we're we're letting we'd rather let more candidates in than keep more candidates out. So we do want to review those applications and see if you do find that diamond in the rough that, you know, maybe we were, uh, you know, not dead set on having somebody with one certain qualification. And so, you know, really, I mean, if, if I had 100 people that applied for a position, a lot of times I might have eight or 10 of them that, you know, might have automatically disqualified themselves. And then, which means I get to look at the other 90. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a that's a lot less than I was thinking. You know, I personally I thought it was half and half or something like that, but that's good to know. And I'm sure with some companies, if you know, you're a Disney and you had 10,000 applicants for that one Disney princess job, maybe right. the applicant tracking does rule a lot of them out. But um, yes, I was reading about that recently and I was thinking, man, I feel so bad for recruiters. Um, how can a job applicant make your job easier? So just a lot of times it's, it's all in being responsive, you know, when, when candidates come through uh, for, and, and for one thing, you know, on the, from, from step one, you know, make sure that you're qualified for the position that you want to do. And, um, and, and I'll be just honest with you about certain things that what I like to say to a lot of people in my head is that just because you can do a job doesn't mean that you're the best candidate for the job. So, and, I'm, and I'll just keep using customer service because it's an entry level position. I get a lot of people applying for customer service positions and they've never worked in customer service. Uh, some of them are outside of any type of industry that we're in and that's perfectly fine. But I know that they're applying because they need a job and they're like, well, I could do customer service. Well, yeah, but there's 15 other people that have been in customer service for like 10 years that are in that same pool of candidates with you. And so sometimes, and it's up to the recruiter that, you know, we might make that call and just see if maybe they would be a fit. But once it gets in front of the hiring manager, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're going to look for someone that is the best candidate uh, that can usually walk in the door and contribute and and, you know, start off right away. So, um, you know, th those are some things just to kind of make sure, you know, make sure it's something that you can actually do and, and that you maybe have experience in. Or even if you have a desire to get into it, then, of course, apply. And then maybe if you get a call with a recruiter, we can discuss if it's an entry level role, if it's a position that we do train for. Because uh, we do have positions that, you know, they, they don't do any training for. They want them to come in with that experience already. And so, uh, you know, really on that front end, making sure so that I don't have to filter through a lot of applications <laughs> that I need to go through. That I don't need to go through. 
Uh, and then, of course, because we are going to do that phone call and that phone screen. So now the time that we're going to invest is, is starting to add up. And so we want to make sure that we're talking to the right person. Um, and I would just, you know, really to be honest about things. So, you, you know, if, if at some point in the, the application process, if all of a sudden you decide that you don't want to apply for that position anymore or you're accepting another position and you don't want to interview with us, just like just shoot me an email or something. Let me know as soon as possible. So then I we can focus more on the candidates that are in the pool that are actively engaged and would like to come in for an interview. Uh, so just being open and honest and communicate throughout the process. And like I say, we don't mind if you reach out to us and I, I get candidates a call, text, email, you know, all, all during the day, some in the evening if when they get off work and it's perfectly fine. I've never rolled my eyes because a candidate text messages me after work. Um, well, unless it's about something that could have waited till tomorrow. But like, you know, versus flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> Those are perfectly fine because you need to know that. So you're not getting an eye roll on that. That's very important. Uh, and so, yeah, but uh, just, you know, communicate and, and be open about everything on your end as well. Open and honest about your process. OK, I have heard of people going through the going to the extent of where they would um, for market research purposes, I guess, mm -hmm. camp out in the park, you know, the day before their interview to see what people were wearing so that they knew how to dress. Cause uh, you know, you hear the advice dress like the people who work their dress. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so people, some people are really dedicated job seekers, probably not and, everyone, but and I, would I can understand the end of the dilemma. Uh, <laughs> I would advise against <laughs> camping out and seeing what people are wearing. Just because, <laughs> well, for the whole reason of, the building that we're in, for an example, we actually share this building with a couple of other companies and they don't have a dress code like ours. So they are wearing blue jeans, uh, tennis shoes and sneakers and T-shirts and stuff a lot. And we do not. So you might see someone leave our building and you're thinking, oh, that's OK. And we go, well, they don't work for us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's great. Maybe you just want the family member leave that was here visiting an employee and doesn't work here. So, you know, I would really, I would really go straight to the recruiter for those questions. Um, Cause, and, and, you know, it kind of goes back into the advice of the interview process. We're not trying to trick you. This isn't like this little game, a cat and mouse game. And let's see if we can trick this candidate. So it's not like we want to hide that from you and go, no, we want to see what you're going to wear. No, we, we're going to want to tell you what to wear so that you can have a good interview. We want to make sure you have a good experience with our company. And you're not going to have a good experience if you show up in sneakers with a Mountain Dew in your hand and, you know, a nose ring <laughs> or something. And none of those were supposed to happen. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's not this cat and mouse. We're not trying to trick you. We don't want to withhold information from you on things like that. Uh, we truly want you to have a good experience with us. So ask away. Now. A question I thought of, I know you said it that facial piercings are against Coca-Cola's company dress code. Mm -hmm. What about inner, what about applicants? Um, you mentioned, oh, they are totally different in person than they are on the phone. What if you have tattoos or, or maybe ear gauges or those fancy earrings? You know what I'm talking about? What if you are, a, you, you have those things, is it against company policy to do that? Or would you recommend trying to wear long sleeves and hiding tattoos? What do you think about that? So we actually address that during our phone screen. And that's another thing that we use that for. And there's actually a paragraph I cover with every single person I took, talked to on the phone about our, um, like representing our brand and everything. And that that does include a, a neat and clean and professional appearance at work. And so we actually recover that. And, and uh, we cover that with all of our candidates word for word. We read it off a sheet of paper. And it explains to them, you know, about the the piercings, tattoo policies, um, you know, hair length, things like that. You know, we don't uh, for our company, we don't allow unnatural hair color. We don't allow mohawks and cuts like that. Um, you know, neatly trimmed beards if you have facial hair and things like that. And we actually cover that before they ever show up in person. And so, and that was kind of goes back back to the you know the pet peeve thing. You know, when 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 someone shows up with a piercing in their face or something like that. I'm like, come on. I, <laughs> I told you that on the phone and the hiring manager knows that you were already told at least once not to wear that, uh, you know, and, and so we do review that and, um, you know, with, with the candidates on the front side. That's good to know. I always wondered, I know military wise, a lot of tattoos. Um, yeah. And that's, it's, I think more common now than maybe ever for millennials and, whatever the generation 
them. Gen Z and. <laughs> Can I there? Yes. Am I frozen? I'm back. Okay. You're back. So, uh, I was saying that millennials now more than ever, not just military, have tattoos and have piercings and do the crazy yeah. purple and pink hair and whatever that generation is after millennials. Mm -hmm. I don't know their name. If, if you know their name, pop it in the comments because I'm drawing a blank. If they even have a name assigned to them yet, that generation. But um, it's really just common to have tattoos. And with, you know, these famous tech startup companies that are wearing T-shirts and jeans to work, mm -hmm. it's got to be difficult from your perspective. And that's why you read this paragraph to people about the dress code to keep people neat and professional appearance. So. That right. Super important. Yeah, and some of the things because we see that, especially when military veterans are applying, uh, you know, we know we know a few things. We know that first they probably have tattoos, <laughs> um, and like for us, it just says that you know, um, you know, if you have excessive tattoos like on your arms, that you just wear a long sleeve shirt that would cover, uh, you know, your tattoos or something like that. So it's not like you can't have them. We just ask that they're covered while you're at work, you know, in in our building. Um, but we we noticed that, and then we also noticed that. Uh, and I was I was the same way. I'll just throw myself out there um, yeah. that uh, after after years of military service, I didn't shave for like a few months after I got out of the army. So, <laughs> and we'll see that you'll see tattoos and you'll see guys that are all of a sudden have these huge beards because they haven't been able to grow them out their entire army career or military career. And so now they want to do that. And like for us, we don't allow like beards that just hang down. It has to be neatly trimmed and kind of close to the uh, the chin line and stuff. So. Uh, you know, but we do just say that just, you know, and if it's a guy like that, like a lot of times for the interview process, some of that stuff's not a big deal. I don't want you to shave off your entire beard, beard that took you a year to grow just for an interview. But if we like you after the interview, we're going to have to let you know, you do know that you're going to have to trim the beard. Oh, um, no. <laughs> you know, <That's> so it's, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you're going to have to, but. Um, you know, we would prefer them to do it for the interview, but we also understand why some of them wouldn't do it, um, you know, when they don't know if they have a position yet. That's great. And Jill clarified for me in the comments. She said that generation I couldn't think of the name for is Gen Z. So there we go. We have there's our Gen answer. Z, and then I think there's Centennials behind them. Um, so <laughs> oh, boy. We are just, uh, we could go down a rabbit hole with that, but I'm sure... Um, in my experience, the, the tattoos are more prevalent in the younger generations just because it's more common to maybe rebel against your parents or something. I'm not sure, but uh, they have more to cover up. So, okay. Um, I, let me think of any more questions I have because I, I have a million I could ask you personally. Um, one thing that I, on LinkedIn, right, do you... Um, does Coca-Cola use LinkedIn to post jobs? What on LinkedIn? How do you utilize the tool as a recruiter? Um, can you just describe a little bit about LinkedIn for us? Sure, and and it's going to vary between each company. So you know, some companies won't put anything on LinkedIn. So I, I always advise anyone that's looking for a position to look on in every avenue possible. Um, but the you know the best place to look is always going to be the company's website because all of their positions are going to be posted there, especially if they're using an applicant tracking system, then it needs to pass through there regardless. And so, you know, we'll use LinkedIn to post positions, but you, you have to remember that companies have to pay for the positions that they're going to post on LinkedIn. So a lot of times it could be what's in their budget. So a lot of times for us, for example, we have a lot of positions. If we posted all of our positions on LinkedIn all the time, we'd, we'd go broke. Um, <laughs> we would spend a lot of money. So we use LinkedIn for a lot of times all those tough to fill positions. And so we'll post those. And so, you know, if, if you don't see, um, you know, a position for a forklift operator for Coca-Cola on LinkedIn, that doesn't mean we're not hiring for one. You need to go to our company website because that's probably where that is. Uh, so, you know, we, we really use that for some of those tough to fill positions or maybe positions that have been out there for a long time. and looks like we just need a little bit more assistance than what our website and sites like Indeed are giving us. And so, uh, so, you know, each company is going to be like that though, where, you know, they're going to pick and choose what they put on there. So if you're following a company on LinkedIn that posts jobs on LinkedIn, that doesn't mean all their jobs are on LinkedIn. Some of their jobs are still going to be held close on their, on their website as well. Okay. That's wonderful. We have a question in the comments, uh, from Lily. 
Has Josh heard of hiring managers or recruiters searching candidate social media accounts? Every day and every <laughs> candidate. And when <laughs> social media accounts in this context, what social media are you searching on? You know, we go straight to Facebook. I'm going straight. <laughs> I am going straight to Facebook. Uh, and and we, we, we certainly do. Um, and a lot of times, though, I mean, you at the same time, and again, this this could be very personal for me. I don't use it to tell me the entire story, but I might use it to just make sure that uh, the story you give me is at least somewhat accurate. Um, you know, we we do look. We we've we've looked on. Uh, what, you know, I, I look at everybody on LinkedIn. I look at most people on Facebook. Um, you know, and and we do we do get into that. So uh, just remember that what you put out there can be seen. Um, and I know a lot of people keep their accounts private and that's fine as well. Um, but we also use it, you know, and I know we always look at things from a negative light. We also use it positive. You know, if, if I see someone that's, that's applying to be, to, that's going to interact with our customers and maybe be in, you know, the face of the company, maybe that's out on the streets with companies and I pull up his or her social media page and I see a bunch of, uh, you know, positive posts and doing things in the community already and things like that. Then I'm going, wow, this person's all, you know, even better than they looked on paper. Um, before we even, even had a phone call. So, uh, but we, yeah, uh, we were looking. <laughs> I, I remember um, years ago, I heard, and this was just some rumor, but I heard, um, oh, you know, recruiters and hiring managers, you know what, it's probably a teacher trying to scare me as a high school student or something. You know, when you're trying to get a job, they have special access and they can see all your private stuff and you've got to be careful with what you post online. Right. Which in general, I think you've got to be safe and post appropriate things online. But uh, I don't, I, tr I don't think that anybody has super secret spy tools, you know, um, for Coca Cola anyway. Maybe no, in no, just, your, <laughs> just your basic Google and Facebook search. Mm -hmm. it's pretty and much uh, have you ever found anything on a Google search that has made you not hire a candidate? Just curious about that. No, not not personally. Well, in, in my previous role, we, we did. So um, at one time I used to be a physician recruiter. And so we have to look for, um, you know, any type of physicians that have any malpractice suits in their record and stuff. And so a lot of times we do just basic Google searches for a doctor, because if a doctor's had a huge lawsuit, it hit the news for that mm -hmm. local area. And so we would find things sometimes like, oh, all of a sudden, oh, he was trafficking cocaine out of his clinic. OK. Um, you know, like you could find the details about like what <laughs> true story, but so you could find the true details about, um, you know, what happened in the incident sometimes based on those searches. Um, but you know, if, if you're looking at your everyday job sticker, most of the time, if you Google your own name, nothing that interesting is going to come up, um, besides your Facebook, you know, social media accounts. Um, you know, sometimes some courts have public access records, so sometimes you'll pop up on there for you know, misdemeanors you've had or whatever. But I mean, most of the time applicants will um, list those in their application anyway. So that's, mm -hmm. that's not news to us. So that's fine. Well, and that I'm assuming that's one of the screening questions um, you probably have is, are you a felon or, you know, one of those types of questions? Yeah. Right? And usually, usually for a lot of companies, all that is, is just something that we want to ask questions about if we need to. Um, you know, it might go through uh, depending on what the what the, the charge was or something like that. But um, it's it's never like used for a hiring decision or, or an automatic disqualifier. Uh, we understand that things happen and, and things come up and people change as well. Um, but you know, some of what we do have to look at. You know, if for example, if someone had a, a, a DUI 12 months ago, chances are their license is probably still suspended. So if they're applying for a role that requires them to drive. I need to see if their license is still valid or, you know, I, I, I need to get into that with them and just kind of see if, if they're qualified for the position based on those things. Okay. This is good. I live in Germany and I was speaking at the high school media to when you graduate high school and try to get a job. And I had put together just a really quick little, presentation with images of good and bad examples of social media profiles. And some of these students were really struggling with the, um, with kind of con concept of, well, it's my page. They shouldn't be looking on my page, but, but you do. So 
Yeah. They so don't it, put it out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, it's their life. They get in there and um, you know, a lot of people but I don't put a for job with Coca-Cola. Um, but in general, I think a lot of people just use it and post a ton of stuff on there, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever they're living at online. And so it's always good to be cognizant of what you're posting. Even if you do post a lot, just be careful with the messaging that you're putting out there. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, you know, and sometimes it could even help, you know, if, if you're applying for a position for B uh, to, for a position that's like a digital marketing rep or something like that for a company and we go to your linkedin or your facebook and you're you're posting a lot of things maybe for your current company or or for other projects you're involved with and you're showing your social media influence and your ability to do those things i mean we're just not you know it's not that we're always looking at it in a negative light sometimes we're saying hey let's check out this person's social media and see if they really are capable of doing the things they say they're capable of doing on their resume and that's the best way to look at it is that you know we're looking at it um you know, on a platform that they weren't preparing for us to look at. Would it give me brownie points if I was applying for a job at Coca-Cola? If I put a face like this with a Coca-Cola bottle? <laughs> yes. Yes. Brownie points. Um, and, and we get it all the time. You know, one of the first questions we usually ask somebody, you know, that I think every recruiter from every company asks is, you know, what is it about this position that you find interesting or something? And usually a lot of our first responses is I love Coca-Cola or, you know, or one of our products. And they just, um, you know, when you have a, a name like that, I mean, it's it's really the first thing that they want to say. Um, but, you know, if, if you're applying for one of our positions and, you know, in one of your answers, you're you're thinking, well, uh, you know, you say something like, yeah, I don't really like drinking Coke and all this. And we're kind of like, well, are you really excited about, you know, being a part of this team or are you just looking for a job? So. So nice. do you picture yeah. do your Coke pose and, and you should be <laughs> <laughs> brownie points. You might at least get a phone call. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's clever. Um, um, so we have a, a question in the comments from Dr. Jill. Um, she's saying I'm slated to teach a writing in the profession class in the spring semester. What types of writing do you find college grads are least prepared for? What kinds of writing would you recommend job seekers practice? So for us, I mean, a lot of times, you know, a lot of our positions are, are, you know, they don't really dive that much into, you know, any type of professional writing or one style or anything like that. Uh, most of the positions that, that we're going to, we're going to fill are, you know, in the IT field or something like that. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about really just, um, basic communication, you know, with everybody, um, you know, I mean, the typical what you would see in, in like an APA format, you know, just standard verbiage, we'll get, well, we will get some applications and resumes and cover letters that, you know, look like, you know, someone with a PhD wrote it, but they're a high school graduate. Um, and I mean, it, sometimes it could be impressive, but a lot of times, you know, you don't know what recruiter you're talking to. That recruiter might only have a high school diploma. Um, and that recruiter might not know the words you're using. And so, you know, we do keep a lot of that kind of basic from the, from the job search side. Um, now I would say that you can find some positions out there that do require a certain style of writing. I mean, especially when you're talking about writing policy and things like that, and they will usually give that to you in the description of that. And so, you know, I would recommend going out there and looking for certain jobs just open it up on a nationwide level go to indeed and look for some kind of professional writing position and then look for you know the dialect that they're using and look and see what they're saying that they want that to look like and that brings me to a question as well for example if you were hiring for a public affairs or somebody else like that that would do press releases or write articles or blog posts or whatever on the application would you have them submit writing samples? And if so, as the recruiter, do you even look at those or do you just kind of say, oh, cool, they did their things. Let me give this to the hiring manager because this is not my job. Yeah, a lot of times some of, the, some of those specific items, a lot of times are going to be requested through the hiring manager. Uh, but it, does, it just it really depends on how that company's recruiting department and how their relationship is set up. Um, I know for mine, and this is just for mine personally, some of the other recruiters and even uh, the Coca-Cola company could be totally different. Um, but for ours, 
uh, you know, a lot of times those none of that would come through at the very early stage. That would come through as maybe after an initial interview, like after the phone screen, maybe after an initial face to face interview. Then the next step might be, hey, we want to see some examples of this. But it's usually not going to be done until you, you've at least sat down with someone and had a conversation about that. So even in like professional writing and things like that, a lot of times we're not going to ask for that up front. But um, and so it is something a lot of times that the candidate could get the information during the interview. So the hiring manager might say, hey, here's an here's basically an assignment that I would like for you to do. And here's what I want you. Here's what I would like for it to look like. I um, mean, so you're not kind of guessing, you know, and, and I've seen in some companies where they'll say, hey, this is, you know, in seven days you have this this to do. And that could be putting together a, a writing example it could be you know, putting together a webinar that you're going to host or something like that. And they'll usually give you the, uh, that information, though, during a, uh, usually during the face to face interview. OK, that's good to know. I know for I do work with folks that are applying for the government um, and that's an entirely different animal that we won't go into. But up front, they request the samples and things like that, assuming that if you had a position at Coca-Cola or any corporation, it wouldn't necessarily be a disqualifier right up front. If the recruiter read your sample and didn't like it, they would just throw it. So, um, Mark, come still in and still in the comments and ask Josh your questions. And uh, I'm gonna, as as the show ends, and if you are watching later, feel free at that time to also hop in put your questions in the comments, ask Josh your questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those for you quickly. So Josh, do you have any final word, any last words of wisdom that you want to share before we tune out for the day? Yeah, I mean, I would just say in, in the in that process in itself, it's very important just not to get discouraged about the, the process. It's stressful for everybody. I know it's stressful on the job seeker who's looking for a new position. It's stressful on the recruiter who's trying to fill the position and it's stressful on the hiring manager who's maybe short one or two employees because they're trying to fill the position. So everybody is up against the wall on it. I mean, it's very rarely what I think that it's a situation where we're intentionally delaying your process or that we have a job out there and we just don't want to fill it. Um, you know, a lot of times we are trying to work through things. Sometimes there's things in the in in, uh, you know, behind the scenes that are going on that we don't have any control over. Maybe they're trying to approve the salary and the budget. I mean, there's a lot of things that we have to wait for sometimes before we can move forward with interviews and things like that. So, you know, if it's taking a long time or something, just reach out to your recruiter. Um, you know, we, I say we, and I, I'm sure some of them might have a problem with it, but a lot of us don't. A lot of it, this is what we do for our career and it's our livelihood. So, uh, you know, just communicate, be honest, you know, with everything that's going on in your end be responsive and attentive to what we're asking you to do because we're trying to get you through the process as well. Um, and, and just uh, definitely always prepare for the interview, show up, <laughs> be dressed accordingly, answer the question, make sure you answer the question that you were asked and, uh, and, and everything should be fine. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today, Josh. It looks like questions. Uh, again, watching, feel free later if you are watching after the show is over. Pop your questions in the comments. We will do our best to answer them. And thank you, Josh, so much for your time today. I know that uh, you hopped on a little bit early to do a tech test with me as I worked through. I couldn't talk to you because uh, you couldn't hear me because I hit the right button. Uh, I appreciate your patience. And uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your work day going through all those resumes and all those applications that you have to go through. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. And bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in.